Yeah, these these games are pretty hard. You know, it's quite a bit of work actually to make and make a game by yourself. And it was all assembly language, and it was all like, and I was doing all the art and all the stuff. So it was like, it was like they were pretty involved projects for me personally. There was a tragic bug in the music driver in, in the in all of the Synapse eight bit titles. But then when they went to the new Atari XLs, the new X, when they updated the operating system of XEs, basically all these all these games crashed, and they all came back. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Catherine Mataga wrote several games that were published by Synapse Software, Seamus, Seamus Case 2, and Zeppelin, then three electronic novels, Brimstone, Essex, and Mindwheel. In this interview, we discuss Ihor Wolosinko, whom I previously interviewed for this podcast. This interview took place on May 17, 2015. Tell me about... The beginning, uh, when you first got started with Atari machines, tell me um, the first uh, time you saw one. So first time you started playing boy, with them. Oh boy, yeah. Let me see. I was, um, yeah, I was, uh, I was doing. Um, I was at UC Berkeley, and I was majoring in uh, electrical engineering in um, in the eighties, I guess. And uh, I think I, I think I saw the Atari machines and like. Actually, no. I think I was in. I think I was just graduated from high school, and I first saw the Ataris because I remember. I, th- I remember I, I wanted to get one, but I had no money. Like just out of high school, yeah. you know. And um, I think that was like. And I remember. I, I remember that time. What there was like the TI and the Atari and all these different machines, you know. But um, um, I don't even remember why I got the. Atari. I think the Atari. Actually, no. It was. I know. I think it's like everybody. It was the Star Raiders. You know, <laughs> everybody saw Star Raiders and thought, oh, there's. There's something special going on in this thing, you know. Yeah. It was like, you know, there was some, there was some unusual, like, uh, you know, electronic magic happening in this box, you know. So, that was the first thing. I think, um, I think what happened was, um, I, I was at college and um, I bought an Atari 800. Like, I, I had a summer job where I worked at a defense contractor. Mm-hmm. Worked at a company called. I worked at a division of Singer. Singer, Singer sewing machines, which made uh, submarine torpedo <laughs> weapon systems, basically. And uh, but it was this company that my father worked at. And Sub- was, submarines that were decorated with the loveliest quilts. Yeah, no, no. It was like it was like what it was. It was uh, it was like, but they had like they didn't do like they didn't do navy stuff for the U.S. They did like they did uh, military stuff for these like foreign militaries or something like that. And my father worked there, and he got me a job, a summer job basically um just sort of monkeying around with code and sort of doing other stuff you know so i think it was maybe i think maybe i don't remember i don't remember what year college was but i I just sort of went out and bought one like uh, one of those years you know and that's when i just started sort of like uh sort of poking at it you know i got the the Atari Basic and started, you know, what is, you know, everybody, what is, remember old days, you know, you typed in the programs and the listings and all that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, I think um, it was a while before, yeah, no, I got that first, what is the original Atari assembler cartridge mm-hmm. that has the, um, that's the world's slowest assembler ever. The world's <laughs> ludicrously slowest assembler ever. And I remember it was like, um, I, oh, I, you know what it was too is I got the Atari reference manual. Like um, it was at um, actually I drove to the Atari office. Actually, they like they had a repair office in in uh, in Sunnyvale, mm-hmm. and I think uh, ah boy, I, th- I was living in my grandmother's house, uh, sort of because uh, she lived in um, in uh, in Lafayette. And I was going to college, like, my, it could last, I was in dorms for a few years, but last year I was at my grandmother's house, and uh, I drove down to San Jose, and I, I picked up the uh, the Atari reference manuals from the uh, office down there, and um, and actually those, that was that was sort of like, oh, then suddenly it was clear, you know, what's going on inside of here, you know. Yeah. I think in those days, it was harder to get documentation, you know, that, that the, uh, you know, the original tech manuals were like... Um, you know, they were the source of all this stuff, you know. But mm-hmm. before that, it was like, you know, those, you go to magazines and stuff, and it was all all about the basic. But, you know, when you had those things, you could see what was really happening and how these games could really work, you know. So you taught yourself assembly language from reading the, the manuals? 
Yeah, I had done some assembly in college. Like, actually, at UC Berkeley in the old days, we did like, we had an assembler class at UC Berkeley. So I did some of that. Like, we did, we did, we did PDP 11 assembly language on um, actually in the original like PDP 11 mini deck mini computers with the little red toggle switches in the front and all mm-hmm. the stuff. So uh, I did a little bit of that in class, you know. Um, but, um, but for the but yeah no I sort of picked you know six five I picked up you know if you do any kind of assembly you kind of I had done some programming in college you know and I had done quite a bit of programming just on my own just on basic and stuff so I, you know I sort of had enough to kind of to sort of put it together and just start doing it basically you know yeah. so and so um, I think the more interesting thing was just the kind of quirkiness of the hardware and you know that it was you know Atari eight hundred had kind of interesting uh, graphics and. Um, so and just working out how that worked and how that how that functioned, you know. So yeah, I just started like banging on the assembly. I remember, I know I told somebody at college that I was going to write a, you know, I was going to write a game or something. I remember that. So I must have been, must have been like just third year of college or so. You know, I just started working on, you know, what would become Seamus eventually, just mm-hmm. in my, uh, you know, at my grandmother's house basically. So was it, was that sort of your your first? Intentional project. If I'm to make a game, is is what I'm going to do? Yeah, I did. I think uh, I don't know. I sort of did. I just sort of programmed a lot of just random stuff, you know, just kind of like you know, just um, you know, just just taking the, um, you know, the sample code and just sort of changing it and trying to get it to work and all that, you know. Um, it was like. I think it was like I'm not sure if that was my first real game. I think I did like I just think I programmed some little card game type things in basic and stuff like that before that, you know. And um I know I know a lot of people were doing sort of mixed like, you know, basic and assembly language. And I, I didn't really do that. I pretty much I did sort of straight basic game you know, programming on the original Atari, just just typing and stuff in and you know, with a basic manual. But then um when I got the assembler, I think I it was yeah, Shames was pretty close to my first like so I think you know, Shames was the first like straight assembly thing that I did, I think. That was sort of a larger assembly project, you know. So Did you what was your, your vision in creating it? Did you have like, okay, I'm gonna make this game about this guy who's looking for you know a- No, not, not really. I think it was more like um it was it was it more sort of the technology, you know, I would say. At the time it was just like, you know, I just wanna get a guy on the screen, you know, and um, just getting enemies to move and and try to figure out like how is that going to work, you know, and, and sort of puzzling over the um, puzzling over the the technical docs. I think that it sort of came out of um, it sort of came out of the Atari hardware itself, really. You know, that basically the things that the game does are sort of things that. Um, things that the hardware is able to do mm-hmm. basically you know and the things that you know you can do you know with the uh with the with the chipsets and with the you know with the sprites and with the with the characters as they are you know so it sort of came out of that a sort of kind of technical experimentation and then working, sort of turned working with that, what you had yeah yeah and then it's sort of like it was like i think i had this idea of doing little guys and stuff and little robots and stuff but there was no paint programs in those days so it was all um Everything was done on graph paper, you know. I did graph paper, and I typed in art into the um, into the uh, into the assembler. And like, I had like wrote down little numbers like one zero one zero one zero, and I typed it in hexadecimal into the assembler. In those days, it was for shame. So it was like, I, it's amazing to me that anybody made a game like this. I can't <laughs> believe that. Like, I can't believe it. You know, it's like, how do you make a game with Eddie? There were no tools at all. There was yeah. an assembler, and that was it. And I think the original was on. Originally, it was on the uh, the Atari assembler. The, the Atari assembler cartridge. That's just terrible. I mean, yeah. that you had it, to suffer with that. I mean, I get there were no graphics tools and stuff, but just like using Atari assemblers, that's just like torture. No, no, it was assembler. And it was like, and but yeah, and I had it set up so like, basically, I would I had different pieces of code would load at different pots of memory. So I didn't build the whole thing together, but like I would set fixed addresses so I didn't have to compile the whole thing at once. So it was like, it was sort of a, you know, it was a sort of it was a bit ambiguous. Just and also because, like in the Atari, like you would load the the, the DOS, the, the 
the the the DOS, and that would take a blow memory. But then on a you know on a cartridge, you want to use that memory. So it would like you know you you know so everything was assembled at fixed addresses. So I could assemble this bit of code. I want to work on this, and then I could assemble this bit of code. You know, and then uh, when I get to Synapse, we basically um, I think uh, Steve Hales had done Synassembler at at. Uh, at Synapse, and mm-hmm. I think we were able to enter, you know, move over the code. It wasn't, it was pretty much, there's a few little tweaks or something that had to happen. Go from the Atari assembler. I hadn't seen Sim assembler until I got to, to Synapse, basically. And then, um, and actually that made it, I, the Sim assembler was, you know, quite a bit faster than the Atari assembler, so that, that sort of smoothed it up a little bit. Though I think Seamus, it never. The source was always in the the weird pieces like this, and always split up in different little blocks. So, and also, I think part of the issue is with the, with the Atari eight hundred is that there's quirky rules about where different where the graphics had to be. You know, a character set had to be on a particular boundary, and the memory had to be in a certain place. And right, it, certain things can't cross a one k boundary or ridiculous yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of funkiness like that, and also like some things had to be in zero page, and just, there's just, just a lot of weird like that that just made it. You know, it made it so, like, you know, it, it was, it, yeah, you didn't just write code, but you had to sort of carefully plan where everything was going to be right. in order for it to work. So that's sort of, yeah. so it was it was always kind of like that, you know. Well, but, for, for being a relatively early game, I mean, 1982, there's a lot going on. I mean, it's not just like you've got four players on the screen. It, it seems like you trick things out to have there's a lot more than four things happening moving at once and and it's kind of awesome yeah 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 cuz basically everything that works everything that moves is um is characters you know i mean cuz if you read the if you read the Atari manuals you think okay i have four players i have four missiles and i can make those move but right. but then but really uh the players are basically two colors, so there's not, and you know, you can have, you know, they're, they're very limited. They're very sort of if you make a long, thin vertical thing, it would have very quirky, yeah. very quirky properties to it. So, so basically, everything was, and the uh, the robots they sort of were on, they were done in character graphics, so they had weird little things they could only move, and the, they sort of carefully moved on little character boundaries. <laughs> that sort of funky, that kind of funky movement, all, all based on keeping them sort of lined up, with kind of. Uh, I guess the four or eight pixel boundaries, you know, depending on which way they were going. So it was like, I think it came out of like, oh yeah, I can make these guys work in characters. That, I think that was sort of the idea originally. Oh, I could make an enemy who functions in characters. And then there's like, you know, there's, there's no, <laughs> there's no limit. I can, you know, I can throw everything I can at the screen at that point, which I thought was, which I hadn't seen in other games. So right. I thought, ooh, that's kind of interesting, you know, and that's, that's sort of what came out of just, you know, just getting a lot of stuff on the, figuring out, having an idea for how to get stuff on the screen. And then, um, you know, at that point, oh, yeah, we could like little robots and shoot at them and all that, you know. And so it came from there, you know. Cool. So how did you end up at Synapse? Were you knocking on doors of many publishers or? No, no, not really. Actually, the, the thing about it is that Synapse was, um, I was in Berkeley at the time. Like my grandmother owned a duplex here in Berkeley and I moved into this building, which I still live in. And, um, uh, Synapse was in Synapse was in Ehor's house in those days, and he was like in. He had like this like mansion that was like sort of sitting on a hill, like over in um, Kensington kind of area, and it was like he had like he had like he was like basically he was like living in the company, and he had like all these like you know he had like all these employees walking around in his house, and you come in there, and he'd be like you know I don't know <laughs> he'd be like in his like slippers or something like that, but it was kind of this very luxurious house where you would sort of you'd kind of be sitting over, and you'd kind of look and you'd see the you'd see the um, the yeah, I guess on the other side of the hill from Berkeley, there's like sort of farms and stuff. That it's not really farms, but it's kind of a, a, a natural preserve or something like that. And there'd be like cows and stuff up there, you know. So it was, I think it was, uh, it was partially geographic closeness is what happened. You know, he was close, and I basically walked in and showed it to showed what I had, and then we sort of went from there. You know, that's how it worked. How much uh, tweaking did he have you do? to go from what you had to the final product we did quite a bit yeah we we did change quite a bit i think that it didn't have the music originally mm-hmm. and it's like um i think originally it was more it was more berserky originally i think than than what it became so it was kind of more like uh there's quite a bit and just you know just playing and bug testing and all that kind of stuff there are no snap jumpers in the original you know part of that was just like 
some of the things were things I just went ahead and did. Some of the things were things that he suggested also. So he had he had quite a bit role in that also, you know. Um, I, you know, he was like, for the most part, like, I wasn't there, though. Like, I would be like, I would be basically in my room, kind of, you know, typing on the thing. And I would sort of basically drive in with a box of bis- discs and sort of and show it, you know. So I didn't, you know, we didn't. I, you know, we we bumped into other people from. I saw Steve Hale, some of the other people from Synapse a bit, but you know, we didn't really like. We didn't. We were like there all day in the office with each other so much. You know, we don't. We didn't. We didn't. Um, so you know, for the most part, it's like, for the most time, I'm here at the computer typing by myself. You know, it's, it's mostly is very solitary. Since I was doing all the art myself, so it was very. In those days, it was like it was just me. There's no there's no one else for the most part, yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> So I don't know. I, um, I, I do remember. Um, I think yeah, and I would see like Mike Potter over there sometimes. I, Mike Potter, I think he was like from. I think he was. I'm not sure if Mike Potter's still around or not, but I think he was from. Uh, I think he was. He's from out of town. I think he would like. He moved to Oregon or something like that at some point. I think. Hmm. But um, we were a bunch of. I, I just met him briefly. I think. But Steve, some of the other people, the main the main person I saw quite a bit was Steve Hales, who uh, was working on uh, what is it, Ford Apocalypse and, and Slime. I think Slime was the game that was going on forever. Like this was Eeyore's great creation. This is his genius idea, and like, <laughs> and all of Eeyore's creative energy all went to Slime, and like, and like, and Steve Hales, where Steve Hales was like endlessly, and it was like it was one of those things where it was like, oh, it's kind of seems like a simple idea. <laughs> But the, basically, making it happen on the hardware was just like hard. You know, it's like you can come up with an idea. Well, this slime should do all this stuff, but like getting it to work was like a nightmare. So I just remember he was working on slime just basically forever. <laughs> that, you know, there was a few other games like that around there. You know, I was sort of off on my own though for the most part. So I didn't like I did. You know, we we talked quite a bit with some of the other people, but you know. Um, I think the other thing that Steve Hales made the um, he did the the music driver like Steve Steve put together the thing that does the uh, that plays the sound and like they had like a system we uh, God how do we do it I, what we did is we had he had a thing that just would basically play the notes and what would happen is we would type in the notes you know from sheet music into you know into the assembler mm-hmm. and basically and make the make the music that way so i didn't have i had most of the sounds were done i did myself but um the music driver sort of was part of them and it was part was mostly steve hales and that same same bit of code was shared between everything at synapse you know some other things i think there was oh the oh i don't remember if there's copy protection there was we did do um we did do cartridge. I don't remember. I think there was copy protection also on the discs of Shames. I don't remember how that worked. That that came from some outside contractor hmm. that we integrated their code with ours, you know. But mostly it was like, you know, it was a work relationship. It was about, you know, you know, making it function, getting all the pit bits into it. And it was, it was surprisingly similar to game programming now. You know, it's just like testing, yeah. playing it and trying again, trying again until, you know, you know, figuring it. I think some of the issues were like, um, you know, like you would go into a room and then the mo- monsters would appear right on top of you, hmm. which would be one of the problems. So, and then you die. So they eventually, we, I made it so that they would come in and they would, you know, either they would they wouldn't appear right at the entrance. You know, you'd have a little doorway at the beginning that you would start with. There, there's a lot of sort of smaller things like that. Also, just in terms of the difficulty of it, of just making it so that you know, so, you know, when you die, there's some subtle things that. Di- difficulty of it so when you died you know the monsters were a little less aggressive afterwards give you a little bit of a rest in that case you know interesting was this a royalty deal yeah 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 this is all royalty so okay. so um yeah so i did it yeah it was surprisingly simple i walked in i showed them i did it and we worked on it they released it and they paid me you know it was very straightforward you know nice. it was not that complicated <laughs> it was so much easier than it is now you know <laughs> you'd like Kids get them as Christmas presents, you know. This is what you find out, you know. And they sort of like, and they have memories of these old games. So they sort of, at least those they don't know. I think the free to play, nobody cares. No one will care about this free to play stuff in the future. But yeah. those old games, people got them. They, you know, they were precious. I remember, like, I remember I had a job interview in like 
I think it was 1990 or so, and some guy said, oh, I played your game when I was a little kid. And this was like 1990, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, it was like, you know, they sort of get around and they get into people's, uh, you know, they become part of people's life, you know? Yeah. Because also, I think you, if you're a kid, you get a game, you play it a lot, you know? Because it was like, they weren't cheap either, you know? Right. Like, like Seamus was like, I think a cartridge, I think the discs were like 30 bucks or 30, 40 bucks. You can play quite a bit, pay quite a bit of money for those games. In today's dollars, that's like 70 bucks or something. Yeah, no, it was like, it was expensive. Everything about the Atari was crazy expensive. I I remember I bought a a floppy disk drive for like $600 and about the unit was like $800 or something like that, you know? It was like, it was not a, yeah, it was not cheap. It was all, it was all new, but it was not, it was not cheap, you know, even in, even by today's standards, you know. So do you remember the moment when Seamus came out and you're holding the box in your hand? And you're just like, wow, I did a thing. Here it is. Yeah, yeah but though, I, thought, though, I, think, I remember it's more like, it's kind of more like these things, they sort of, I think this has always been the pattern. They sort of grind to kind of unsatisfying halt where you think you're done and then like something comes up and then you're not done and then something else comes up and then you're not done and then you're not done and then it like it sort of finally comes up and then it sort of happens you know yeah. so I don't really I, don't, I remember going to stores and seeing it but I don't really remember a moment like ooh, ooh it's you know it's it's physical you know yeah. I, you would think that would happen but no I don't I remember the programming I don't remember the I don't remember the I don't remember the anything about like it coming out or anything. For the most part, it's like I'm. I remember getting money for it, though. That's what I remember. I remember getting paid for it. So that's like that's what stuck in my mind more than anything else. You know, there's not this. Yeah. There wasn't this like. You know, there was a like. There was a like. I think it is kind. Of, it is cool though to go to go to stores and see like little boxes where they have stuff you worked on. Actually, that it's like it's it's like it is does seem real then. You know, yeah. so it, it didn't seem like. You figure, ooh, you know, I would go to like the the mall, you know, the game, like, like I don't know if it was electronics boutique, but you know, it was one of those, one of their predecessors, or yeah. it was like in Egghead um, or one of those. No, no, it wasn't Egghead. This was actually this was before that. I think this was, um, I think this was. I would there would there would be like Atari's. There were like computer stores that specialized in like Apple and Atari and stuff like that. You know, so it was like, I think in the early '80s, it was mostly independent game stores, and you would, I would go in and I would, you know, I'd see the games there. So. Yeah. It was like, so I, I saw it. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember like a stunning moment of you know, like, oh boy, it's out. It's just like, it just sort of happened, <laughs> and then I got money. You know. Yeah. Was Seamus case two a foregone conclusion or or? Uh, no, or no, or? no, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all. Seamus actually, Ehor wanted me to do Slam Ball, which was his other great idea. You know. Okay. And we started on that, and it just it wasn't happening. You know, and it just. It was sort of like we were just sort of thrashing around, and it was just like I don't know. And I sort of came, I did a bunch of stuff, and um, and I think we were both kind of frustrated by it actually. And it was he just and he and he had this and his slam ball was this thing that he had he was working on. I think eventually another guy took it over and like yeah, I, I'm, not, and, I'm looking it up to see if it was a. a th- I'm not familiar with it. If it was, a- I think there was a poster for it. I don't know. But somebody else, and it was like this. He had this thing of it's going to be this pinball game, and all this stuff is going to happen. But it was just basically. But the problem is, it was like a lot of design for very, very primitive hardware, you know. And it was like, and I, you know, I wasn't really sure what he wanted, and it was just like, uh, and it was, it just wasn't happening, you know. Yeah. So we were like. Uh, but I had all this stuff I had coded, and I had like, so I sort of thought, well, then we sort of, we had this game, we thought, well, maybe we should, because we started on this, and then Seamus started doing well, and then what happens, we turned this game, we kind of like, took this thing we had, and we kind of shoehorned it, and kind of, Seamus case, made it, turned it into Seamus case too, basically, is what happened. So that's that's where that came out, basically. Yeah. Oh. And actually, that did okay. For Seamus case too, I think it came out on the Commodore, even, it did it did alright, you know. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge hit, but it was. It's it's a very strange game. I played it, and it's like I don't know. It's like it's this thing that just came out as a result of you know, <laughs> just random chaos and just development <laughs> problems and development <laughs> disasters. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I I think it's a strange game because I don't know. I was reviewing it this morning. Like you start off, you're walking around, you're exploring it, everything's normal, and then all of a sudden you're in this room. 
Yeah, well, like no, you're, you're, you're playing demon attack all of a sudden. Yeah, no, I agree. You can't jump, agree. you can fire. And then and they go to the river, you can jump again. No, yeah. I agree, I agree. It's like, no, I totally admit it, that it's, <laughs> it is a weird... It, it's just weird. It's like, you know, you could get away with that in those days, you know. You could just sort of, like, put a bunch of stuff in, and then, oh, let's have this, and then we'll have this. Well, oh, this little sort of fishy-looking thing will so be attacking you, I'm not sure why, but it was never really... It was not like... It was not... There was no, like... Uh, moment of creative genius of this thing it just kind of like it was sort of this mass of stuff that kind of fell together and then we kind of shoehorned into a game basically you know so I don't know it it is it came out we finished it you know yeah. and um but it is what it is you know yeah it's a fun game I mean it's it's silly I it, a sense of you you see it's, like you have a sense of humor that comes it through. was yeah it was like yeah no I guess so you know yeah I didn't even know but yeah I guess so you know it did yeah yeah, I guess you know the thing about there's a magic to doing something by yourself, you know, and maybe someday I'll do that again too. Or like I, you know, I just live with the bad graphics. I just sort of do everything, but but I can't really, I I, I cannot actually draw, you know. <laughs> it's just like so, it's like I think when I try drawing, it just you know what I mean. There's sort of a natural clumsiness and kind of sort of sort of goofiness that happens as as a result of me sort of trying to make something look like something when I am just at the core of my being. <laughs> genetically incapable of doing it <laughs> properly you know so that, i think that's that's partially what happens you know it's just like but yeah no i think i have the persistence to sit there and just just bang on it and push pixels all day but i don't actually have the drawing talent to make it look proper so th- i think that's partially what's happening everything just ends up basically i sort of draw things and they look completely broken or they look completely wrong but i get a few things every once in a while that sort of look kind of like something and then that would be the thing i would stuff in the game you know i think some of the other people were like some of the other lot of some of the other synapse games just had much you know kind of better art talent behind them you know so i mean you know that's, yeah. that's kind of what happened you know okay so synapse case two came out and next up uh was zeppelin yeah, oh, I love Zeppelin. Now Zeppelin's Zeppel- a completely different game. How did that? Why did that happen? Um, well, let me see what happened. Yeah, I think what happened was, um, I think that like the the Shames case two was kind of we sort of rescued kind of a messy situation, you know, and um, and I just sort of made it. I just kind of made it. I just sort of made the start of it, you know, just kind of on my own. I just started sort of banging on the Atari, and I just sort of walked in and you know. Um, I think partially it was like I started. I started, you know, it's. I started working on tools actually because I, I, I realized I think by shame is by Zeppelin that like having no art tools and working from graph paper is kind of a problem, you know. And um, I basically started just to make you know tile editors and you know it, pieces. I, I would made I made some utility so I could like edit the edit the worlds and edit characters and all of that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, actually, this happens pretty often. Actually, this is not too far from how games get made today, even so. But, you know, you kind of have a tool. And then the tool, there's sort of a natural sort of game that kind of falls out of the tool that you've made. You know, so you make a tool that kind of edits, like, little worlds or edits little screens and character graphics. Um, and then you kind of like, oh, wait a minute, I could, like, scroll across this, you know. And it sort of, it, it just became that, you know. It sort of fell out of, it fell out of this tool that I had created. And then... Um, you know, and I thought, and I, we, I just sort of started adding stuff onto that. You know, I think Zeppelin was much more me than um, than Ehor. You know, you had more Ehor was much more input on uh, Seamus, but I think in, in Zeppelin it was much more. I just sort of did it. You know, I think that Ehor was kind of um, Ehor was working with like Bob Polin and was working on like some other stuff at the time, and he was pretty busy with those guys. You know, and um, so I figured, well, you know, and. Uh, I had I I just sort of started at least as near as I can remember I just sort of started putting it together you know and just started sort of using my sort of mediocre art skills to sort of like you know try to do something that sort of looked like something that wasn't completely broken and and sort of like uh, that's sort of like uh, you know what what became of it you know it's like it was like what I could actually manage to get get on the screen that looked not like you know a completely broken blob of pixels it was the thing that sort of ended up in the game and you know it became little like uh, little switches and all of that kind of stuff and the um and the maze I, I know zeppelin is ludicrously hard <laughs> it is like it is crazy hard though i did i did play it all the way through i, I think with all of these games i made sure that i could like 
I played them all all the way through by myself. So <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't ship anything that I couldn't finish myself. You know. Were there other games that were attempted and abandoned? There were no. There, there weren't any real. Um, I did some other like experimental things on myself. I did some them sort of like Pac-Man type things and stuff like that. But I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really get anything like too far like that. You know. I mean, um, I really. It's like yeah, these these games are pretty hard. You know, it's quite a bit of work actually to make yeah. and make a game by yourself. And it was all assembly language, and it was all like, and I was doing all the art and all the stuff. So it was like, it was like they were pretty involved projects for me personally. So I would be, I would just, you know, it would be, it was a lot of hours just sort of sitting and kind of, you know, doing making the game, and also just it was a lot of time just playing it because I didn't have any testers. You know, I would like, I was basically. Make programming it and doing the art and testing it myself for the most part, you know. So, it, you know, and it took a lot of time to get through it. I mean, I I brought it to Synapse and they would they would test it, but it was like you know, it was not like a game development is now, you know, where you would have just much more, you know, you have like a staff of people, you know, who would t- t- to hand these things off to. So, um, so these were just like yeah, so they're small games, but yeah, for a single person, there it's it's a lot. You know, and it was just like it was a lot of time, and it was yeah. it was hard work, you know, to, do, to to make that stuff happen, you know. But it was cool, you know. I was getting published, you know. It was kind of it's cool to to do it. I sort of got hooked on it, you know. Just you kind of do it, and then it comes out, and then you've done it, you know. And it's like there it is, you know. So it's like yeah, it's like and people playing it and all that. Yeah. So, did, you get le- did you get letters from people, fan mail? Uh, I think I think Synapse got letters, but I didn't see that much myself. I did, I had very little interaction with anybody who played it, to be honest. You know, I would see it in stores and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I was surprisingly little interaction with any actual um, community or anything like that. You know, I was never, I, I was, I was not really the, I didn't really go to like, the, you know, the computer clubs or the shows or all that kind of stuff. You know, so much. You know, I was more, for me, it was more about. I think it, for me, it's always been like I'm like it's about the process, about making it, you know, and you know, and kind of making games is about s- sitting in the chair yeah. and and typing in the code and you know pushing the pixels or doing what you got to do to make it happen. So I'm, I've been more, I'm, I haven't been so much so community focused really, you know. I mean, that's maybe that's why I sort of was a little bit. <laughs> I've been, I've just been distracted, you know. By me. It's just like this. It's exactly just like this. You know what I mean? Nineteen eighty is exactly the same. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, I can't talk to you now. I'm busy working on this other game project. That's some sort of great big thing I'm working on. Some horrible bug I have to fix or something like that. It's always some sort of like some sort of horrible, so very important chaos. But it's all about being at the terminal and like, you know, typing in the code and fixing the issues. So that's kind of sort of <laughs> was my experience. So what brought on the transition? You had these 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 games with a lot of graphics and movement and sound, and then your next three games, your last, your last three Atari games, were text adventures. What brought on that change? Oh uh, well, partially it was like it was sort of market driven actually. That what happened was, um, I think uh, I think the timing of this was uh, you know it was there was just you know the kind of Atari 8-bit market, you know, it was sort of, it, it was like, when Seamus came out, like, Atari 8-bit was just, was hot, you know, you could just ship anything, and it was like, you know what I mean, I mean, you could, I mean, you don't have to ship anything, but you could like, <laughs> <laughs> no, you made a game, you made a game that looked pretty good, and it, it, it people would buy it, you know, and it was like, it was amazing, but, and, but then we sort of felt like, you know, we sort of felt like, ooh, ooh, this is kind of like, you know, we're sort of seeing the end of the line here a little bit, you know. And um, and I know some people kept working on kind of eight bitty you know arcadey games, but there were it got to the point where Synapse wasn't really that crazy about even releasing them anymore. You know, they just had released so much product, and and so we we just we you know we we needed to like reinvent a little bit. You know, at that point, um, I think. Um, yeah, it's so so it was like, and you know, there's just a lot more competition, I guess, and you know, I, 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 
don't remember quite. Yeah, it was like I remember like Synapse had like released like the there's the two packs of games. Like they'd released two games in one pack and all this kind of stuff. And there was this like this big backlog of people working on games and all this stuff. And they sort of shoveled all of these out on these these two pack game deals. And those things like you know they never they never really you know you know they. There's just, they just they didn't have the I guess they didn't have the money to advertise them for and they just they just you know they just didn't quite go on, going so it was partially it was like this mark driven I think I think there was this was the game crash I think um, uh, mm-hmm. I think this was about eighty I'm not sure what the exact time of the game crash but it was like eighty four yeah. the Atari a- Christmas eighty four. Yeah, 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 like the, the when all the Ataris went into all the Atari game, you know the famous story, all the Ataris go into the bulldozer. You know, Synapse had Synapse had also had some problems too, actually, and that is um there was um there was a tragic bug in the music driver in, in the in all of the Synapse eight bit titles. Really? And it was like, yeah, none of the yeah, you know, the thing about it, all what happened is like all the Synapse games were like uh they were all assembly. They didn't actually touch the operating system all that much, actually. Mm-hmm. So they were pretty much they should have been fine when we went to uh the new Atari XEs and the new Atari systems came out. But what happened was there was a bug in the music driver. That basically, you know, it was like, and it had some quirky. It had a return interrupt instead of return. It had return instead of return interrupt. Or some, it was just a single stupid mistake instruction. But just due to a random quirk of ran, where the memory was on the Atari 8-bit, it worked, and they shipped. But then when they went to the new Atari XLs, the new X, when they updated the operating system of XEs, basically all these all these games crashed, hmm. and they all came back. They, like a giant, the giant horde of them all came back. So it was, it, it was, you know, you know. But but the thing is, I had gotten, I was not there, I was not part of that. So, but I think, I, I'm not sure, but I know the games came back, in, including some Seamuses and all this stuff came back. But I was no longer, I had sort of gotten out of that. You know, we, had, I moved on to electronic novels and all that, sort of around that time, that all of that chaos was happening, and sort of that's what happened. And we were thinking too of like. You know, I mean, partially the issue was, was just was the PC. You know, there's all these like like the like the, the IBM PC was coming out, and how do you make a game on this strange platform that has like the mono graphics adapter that has no, uh, you know, has no graphics at all, and right. in it, you know, and we're trying to figure like, oh, how are we gonna like, how do how are we gonna attack this, you know? And also there was like Infocom was also doing quite well with the uh, text adventures at the time. So we thought, you know, I pitched it. To, actually, this was my, I did pitch this to Ehor, that the text adventures and, um, and, you know, and we, we thought, well, we'll just go after this. We'll go big on this. You know, we'll just we'll push it as hard as we can on this and see how we can do, you know, so that, so that's where that came about, you know, and the part, and the Ehor's sort of, what Ehor's contribution to that was like sort of that. The finding the the finding the writers. I was sort of the I, I designed the sort of engineering behind that, but Ehor was responsible for getting the. Um, he found like uh, Robert Pinsky and some of these other guys, you know, who uh, who did write for us, you know. Yeah, and which just seems of, like strange. Like, yeah, he found like real people. I mean, real writerly people. Yeah, no, but he was he was that kind of guy though too. You know, he was he was he was kind of like he was in this in the eighties. He was sort of like a seventies kind of like. It sort of reminded me of Martin Mull a little bit, you know, in the in the what is it, the the Marin movie a little bit, you know. He's kind of like he's a, he's a very laid back and very, but but he was a, there was some genius there too, you know. But but he had he had a way with people, you know. Me, I'm like cloistered. I'm like yeah. I'm type, type 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 all day. But he was much more. He was much more. And yeah, he. I think he just put out an ad, you know, and he just said, you know, we're looking for people to work on stuff. And also, I think that writers are hungry. Yeah. Even in yeah. the 80s, writers are hungry. You know, it's not an easy way to make a living, actually. And right. I think it's still true today. You know, if you say, well, you know, I'm the, we're making a game, we're looking to hire writers, we're going to build a game around your writers, you know, and you're going to you're gonna get some pretty good stuff comes in the door. If you're, if you're going to pay them actual money to do this, you know, you're going you're gonna to find some pretty good, you know, you'll find some talent. So I, I, I don't think that was unique to the time either. You know, writers have always been a little bit, you know, you can find pretty good writers, you know, especially, you know to do stuff and they're anxious you know they're they, they want to do good work and they want to like work around all this stuff and they, they were all they were all quite interesting people you know yeah. and they're all and they're all sort of but they're also kind of you know live by their wits you know able to sort of <laughs> you know what I mean and it, you know looking to work on little projects but also you know a little bit of money but also they want to do their quality work you know they're kind right, of that right. kind of attitude so right so 
on the on the technical side of things, you did the the the, the interpreter, right? Yeah, uh, the, yeah, yeah. The, the better than Zork. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Interpreter. Talk to me about. I mean, obviously, you'd played Infocom games. So how did you want to approach it so that it was different and better? Um. Yeah. Well, we, I, well, I had no. We had no idea how the Infocom games worked at all, actually, to be honest. But mm. uh, but but my idea was. Um, Actually, my idea was like we had the, the core idea behind it was basically kind of a propertyless type system, basically where it had basically you had objects and then you had a, then you had an attribute and then a property value to it, and that property could be like a piece of text or something like that, you know. So it'd be like you know I would have like you know I'd have you know a, a box and it would have an open property or something like that, and it's, and that's that's essentially the whole thing. It's all based on. Um, it's basically a kind of a property model of uh, of structuring data, but these things could also point to other objects that would have other properties to them, essentially. And that's how it was. And we and we basically created sort of dialogue maps, and we created sort of character maps of how it might work. I did. There was a lot of like experimental stuff that didn't quite work in these games, to be honest. You know, just kind of like, oh, I can try this. You know, it's like I don't even remember, but I just remember sort of a lot of sort of trying random things of like, oh, you're. T- because it's sort of an impossible project a little bit, you know, to say, oh, I'm going to talk. There aren't little people in the game. There's like, there's, you know, there's, there's an 8-bit computer there with like, you know, with not much memory. So, right. <laughs> so but it's all about, um, you know, it was just, uh, there was just core of it was this idea of, of objects and properties and then of text, uh, you know, and of linking the messages and, and then a language system that would say, oh, okay, I'm, I have, you know, it would fish around and try to find, try to, Basically, try to, basically do what you think it do is try to parse a grammar of sentence, you know. But also trying to think, you know, the sort of the kind of text adventure you kind of send is, you know, open book, open box with, you know, meat cleaver or something like that, you know. Right. So, but 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 pretty much, pretty. But there wasn't any sort of high level thing too much to it. But but I think we did start off with kind of a basics of a data structure where we could sort of add a lot of stuff and sort of kind of build build the environments and things that way in the text world you know so i did work i did do some of the i worked with i think i st- i worked with pinsky first and then uh i think that that then he moved from me to steve hales at some point so but pinsky came over to my house here i think yeah pinsky lived in berkeley at the time and he came over here and uh, i started with pinsky and then what happened was the thing started to grow and i think so that pinsky ended up moving off with steve hales and then i was just working on um the kind of you know underlying system well think about that thing it was involved going in a lot more actually so in the adventure games i was and the text in the video games i would just i would just do them on my in my house mm-hmm. but, uh, and and the text adventures like we would i would be coming in quite a bit more so we'd be in the office and uh you know, there, it was just, it was like, you know, it was like, uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever worked in games, but it's, it's kind of like, like what games are now. This kind of big chaotic process, you know, of like, of it, oh, the build's broken or everything's crashing or there's some weird problem. And it was just sort of endless, like, testing and, and tweaking and dealing with technical chaos you know it was sort of all of that you know and a lot of like a lot of designers with like great big great big ideas about what should be and then a lot of just just a lot of chaos and drama about but mostly about arcade phys- you know problems you know and also issues like memory problems and stuff like that too much memory game runs too slow all, all that kind of stuff it's a lot of was a lot of the effort of that for me you know because I'm on I was sort of working on the technical side of it and also because we had to support so many platforms that we had to like, you know, it meant just learning a lot of har- having a lot of hardware around and just you know those old, just just moving data between different you know on Commodore and Atari and all that stuff. It was, you know, it was kind of cumbersome those days. You know, it was not, you know, it wasn't easy to sort of to, to have a a work process that you know made games for all of these different platforms. So that was that was a large part of it too. Yeah, you know, just doing that scale scale of it, you know. Yeah, and then you just moved on to. Other, it seems like you just slowly moved on to other platforms. The Atari died away, and so you moved on to. PC yeah, and other yeah, things. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of around that time, like you know, they, you know, and and I, you know, it was, it was Synapse too. Partially is what happened with Synapse is like, Synapse was an Atari company, and we just had there were endless people clamoring for Atari stuff. 
and they would say, "Oh, we want more Atari stuff, more Atari stuff." But Synips had this idea: "Oh, we got it. We're going to do. We're going to be in the the PC market is is you know forty times as big as the Atari market. So we'll make forty times as much money as on the PC market. But then you know they'll release games for the Apple II or the PC, and they would sell like you know two thousand copies or something. You know, so it was, so it was like." I think they had ambitions of you know of taking over you know the you know playing in the big pool a little bit and taking on the you know taking on the big companies. Yes. So so the, so the emphasis wasn't wasn't there anymore. And the, the problem is the Commodores came out and you know and really the Atari the issue with the Atari was that it was uh, the Commodore had a little more memory and 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 the and the, and the disk drives had a little bit more space you know. And so oftentimes, like, you know, you would make a game for the Commodore and you try to put it on the Atari and you just have to rip stuff out, you know, to do it. There would be no way to do it. Or it would just take a lot of, you know, you could make a game that would work on both, but then you'd be competing with games on the Commodore that would use all the memory that would fill up a whole floppy disk, you know. So, like, the Atari was like, I think the, because we could only really sell games on the, you know, even though they came out with double-sided, double-density disks, you know, you could never, you couldn't ship a game on that. Right. You'd have to ship a game on... Um, on a 90k floppy and i think on a Commodore it was like 130 or something or 170 i forget exactly so so that it it just made it hard to take along the com the atari also you know also partially what happened too was um oh yeah you know i do remember now partially what happened too was that the synapse had done the um um zaxon mm-hmm. they had zaxon and uh I think part of the part of what happened was that I think they released Zaxxon, and I'm not completely clear if this is the maybe Ehor would know better than me, but I think I mean kind of my perception of what happened was is we released Zaxxon, and then what happened was is people all the store said, oh Zaxxon, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna turn in my original 8-bit, I'm going to turn in my product that I have, my original Synapse title, and then I'm going to have, use that credit, and I'm going to take in Zaxxon. <laughs> so a lot, of the, a lot of the old, you know what I mean? Because Zaxxon, everyone knows that. That's like a great big hit, right? Huh, yeah. So, so, I think, so I think the problem is like, I see this, you know, you want to go to like, you want to sell this other thing, and then so the things that don't, you know, the stores want to have in their shop, the things that sell the most, you know, that sell sure. the easiest. So, you know, doing original titles on Atari 8-bit was, and it was hard relative to to the Commodore 64. So that, that's partially why it's kind of, you know, ended as a, kind of a viable game platform. You know, even though it, it lasted a while, you know, and we thought I was thought, well, maybe you know, what is that Atari game system that came out? But um, there, there was one. What is what that that Atari game system that was that was the 8-bit computer? The, 50, the Atari 5200. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um but you know, it just it never really got, you know, yeah. I don't know. Synapse it was you would think that oh Synapse we should, we'd, we would like be heading right into that, but no, no, they were they were sort of they had their eyes in the um on the PC and and Apple world at that point, which which they would they didn't do so well at, you know. And so yeah. they 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 didn't they weren't they, I th- I think some stuff might have made it to 5200, but but it wasn't so, you know. It wasn't. It didn't. It didn't become. It. We didn't think. Oh, we're going to become a fifty-two hundred game company, right? right? Which is probably a good thing because the fifty-two hundred didn't do so well. In the yeah, picture. no, I know, I know, I know. But that's how it goes, you know. Can you summarize the rest of your career from Atari till now in three minutes? Go. <laughs> the rest of your career now. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I tell you, it's surprisingly similar. Yeah. Game for game programming, it surprisingly doesn't change. You know, it's like the same thing. You said you got bugs. You have like you have compilers that take forever. You have like these. There's all. There's there's always been a tremendous amount of sitting and waiting for things to finish. You know, and in the old days, it was waiting for your assembler, and now you're waiting for your light maps to build. So <laughs> it's like it's like a room full of people all with problems. So. <laughs> And it's all like it's the same kind of business, really. You know, nobody's sure if they're going to make money. So, yeah. it's just like I think also. So I mean, that's that's what's surprising to me. You know, the technology changes, but in a way, what hasn't changed. And also, I think maybe the thing that's changed for me is not doing art anymore. And maybe it's something I, you know, maybe I don't know. You know, maybe I'll retire or something. I'll do some do some old games with bad programmer art again. You know, I may go back to that at some point in the future. Can you tell me what you're working on now? No, 
I actually cannot tell you. I cannot tell you what I'm working on now. I, I can tell you that we were, the thing I was talking about was um, I was working on Spirit Lords with Kabam, mm-hmm. and that came out just uh, that came out a little bit ago and went wide. I think it was um, Editor's Choice on Apple, and I was doing um, I was doing multiplayer and some other you know some sort of gear hitty type things on that basically. So, and the thing I'm working on now I cannot say. Okay. Hmm. Intriguing. A couple last ones. Do you have? Uh, you still have an Atari or any of your your old stuff? I do. I actually I do. I do. I still have an. I still have an eight bit. I I did toss a lot of junk, but I kept my old Atari eight bit. So I did. I did. I did. Everyone. I did buy like, um, what is it? That ape thing. The ape. Uh, the USB ape interface. And mm-hmm. I, I have. I have. I have some of that stuff going on still. I have not loaded that much, but I did. I did. I do have some eight uh, bit stuff lying around actually. Nice. So, do you have any of your source code or anything? Anything that hasn't been? Oh, I got a. I got a giant pile of dusty disks that I have to go through, and I don't sure. I'm not sure how many have survived or not. You know, and it's like it's one of those projects, but I, yeah. I've been busy, so I haven't. I get it. You know. if, you, if you need help, I have all the equipment to transfer stuff. And, oh, yeah, uh, and yeah, that's cool. That's borrow cool. it, send it back, and I've done that for several people. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's cool. That I'd love, love to uh, save those discs before they rot yeah, away. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I get it. But, yeah, just been distracted, my wife, and just sure. making a living and all that kind of thing. Last question. If you could send a message to the Atari 8-bit community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you, <laughs> what would you tell them? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Yeah, just keep going. Keep playing your Ataris, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> keep on. <laughs> Stay with it, you know? <laughs> Atari 800. Well, it actually, it's, it's still fond. In my, it's my first kind of real system I did games on, actually. And it is still kind of, it's still fondly remembered by me, actually, as the thing I wanted kind of as a teenager and ended up working on. So actually, I, I do fondly remember the Atari bit stuff. And every once in a while, I sort of look at forums and stuff like that, you know, for Atari bits. You know, I've been part of the community, but I'm sort of like, you know, I've been, I sort of keep an eye on you guys now and then, you know. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate.